All right, here's an illustration. It's been a hot minute. Uh, so if you've seen it before, I apologize. Not really. If you haven't, it's great. So here you go. Imagine this is your life. This is, this is a string that I put tape around at the beginning. But imagine this is the timeline of your life, right? Birth, boop, death, boop. Those are the sound effects for birth and death. Don't question it. Birth, death, right? Um, if, you look, if you look up and you do the math, which is not that hard, I went to public school and even I can do it. It says that uh, if you take the average uh, death of a, of a woman in America and the average death of a man, divide by two, it's 76 years. This average age of death is 76 years here in the United States of America. And for those of you that are taking your Social Security retirement on time, you get your Social Security at what age? 67, which means you have nine years to enjoy yourself. Nine years to enjoy yourself, right? That's the way that that works. And if you're like me, uh, all those uh, Merrill Lynch commercials and all the commercials that come on during sports, uh, and when you meet your, with your advi financial advisor, they tell you that you should work and plan and think and fret and, and, and slave and, and do all you can during these years because right here when that cuts off, this is the entire focus of your life. Make sure, that, make sure that you have your ducks in a row. Make sure that you, you know, take three, four jobs just to make sure that when you get here, you have enough. And I don't know about you, but there's been a couple of nights where I've sweated little buckets being like, I don't know what's going to happen in the future because we're so worried about that. And you have a very, very long time here and a very what? Short time here. That's the way that you and I are told to think about life. God, on the other hand, thinks of life a little bit differently. God says that you are born here and that you die here. And then after you die, you exist forever. I wanna say forever, right? So, so if, Jesus, if, if the Bible is correct, and I believe it is, if Jesus is right, and I'm, I'm going with him over you, no offense, that's just the way, it's just the way I'm rolling, right? Then, then he says that once you die at 76, whatever it is, then you live forever. And what he says is instead of spending your entire life and in all of your worry and all of your focus and all that stuff to focus on these nine years. Now, listen have a Roth IRA, right? Do, do your job, right? I'm not saying that, right? But Jesus says, what if we spent, right, living today and life tomorrow, what if we lived our life thinking about this line? Because an opposite of this one, right? Because this one you think, oh, this is very, very long time. It's a very, very short time. Jesus changes that on his head. This is a very, 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 it's an infinitely short time compared to that. By, this, by the way, this rope just, it's, it's an infinite rope. Don't question it. It just keeps going all the right, right? And so, because this is a short time and that's a long time. This is, listen, this is the main point. This is why we've called it smart investing, living today and life tomorrow. We're investing for that forever. Listen, I'm going to show you real quick. First Thessalonians, it only has five chapters. Let's go through all five. Chapter one, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to wait for the son of God from heaven. Why? Because he's coming back for all that. Number two, chapter two, it says, what's our hope? What's our joy? Is it not when our Lord Jesus comes back? Chapter three, what is he talking about? He says, listen, I want you guys to start loving each other. Let it increase and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because we're going to be in the presence of our God and the Father when our Lord Jesus comes back. Chapter four, it says, listen, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to grieve as, as though you don't have any hope. I want to tell you because there's this thing, Jesus comes back and he changes all of that. And in chapter five, right before we did this, he says, brothers and sisters, regarding the end times, I just want to let you know what's going to happen when the day of the Lord comes, when Jesus comes back. All that to say is we've been talking for eight weeks. This is the last week in, the, in this series about smart investing, living today, not in light of this tomorrow, but in the light of that tomorrow for all of eternity, right? And today, what I wanted to talk about is building a church for our future. Y'all say that with me, building a, church building a church for our future. All right, because here's the deal. Uh, Paul has given us, Paul wrote 
the book of First Thessalonians. Paul wrote this book and he gave us all these, he said, think about this, think about this, think about this. And at the end, he gave us a list of things that he wants the church to do. Now, here's the thing. It's a list. And if there's a list, then you have to write a list sermon. Here's the deal. I don't like list sermons. I'm just being truthful. I like story sermons. I tell a story, and by the time of the end, you don't even know the story's ended, and you're like, oh, that was a good story at the end of the story. This is 12 things. Everyone say 12 things. 12 things that we have to go through. But I tell you what, I think they're pretty good. But here's the deal. I'm just letting you know, you're going to have to hold on to your horses or hold on to your hats or hold on to your butts. Whatever you got, just hold on to it because we are about to go right through this thing. All right. So number one, number one takes a little more time than anything else. And then they start going. Okay. But the first thing we're going to talk about is you and your pastors. So everyone say me and my pastors. All right. Because normally it'd be pastor, but we're a special church. Y'all get two for one. This is how that works. Right. And it says this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters. So those of you online, those of you here, Grace United, we ask of you that you acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. You need to hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. What he's talking about is pastors, elders, and staff, but particularly pastors. And he's, the thing that he says about pastors, the thing that he says about us is that we are those who do what? Work hard. Now, here's the deal. And I'm only going to tell you this. We don't bring this up often, but because of this passage, I want to let you know what it looks like to be a pastor. Just so you understand. Because some of y'all think, hey, a pastor gets up there for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning, gives some sort of mediocre speech, gets paid, and goes home for the rest of the week and does nothing. Right? Okay. All right, here's the thing. Number one, most pastors didn't set out to be pastors. Bishop, I don't know if Bishop has ever told you, but he used to play football. <laughs> it never brings it up, but apparently he was pretty good. You know, uh, Lou Holtz wanted to come to the University of Arkansas, like he had a good trajectory to be a pro. And then the Lord called him from the foosballs to this. Me, Twice as manly as that, he called me to be an architect. Like, I wanted to be an architect. Like, I was going to be an architect. And he's like, I don't want you to design buildings. I want you to design the building of God. I just made that up. I like that. So, right, that's just, that was not written down, but that's good. Okay, uh, right. So, number one, we, were, we had other plans. We both, we all, most of us had other plans. Number two, most of us have an education. I'm just, I'm just I'm not, I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you the work hard part, right? So I know Bishop, Bishop has his undergrad and he has his master's degree. I have my undergrad. I have two master's degrees. It sounds better than it actually is, but I do, right? This is the way it worked, right? And so, so like we, you know, I got out of five years of college because it took five years for me to get out of college. And then right another four years in graduate school uh, to, 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 to learn what I need to learn here. So move here. And then here's your average work week for a pastor. My work week, which is shorter than Bishop's, I work a six day work week. I start on Sunday and I get off on Friday. I have Saturdays off unless something comes up on a Saturday like yesterday. And then I work a seven day work week, which is different from Bishop. He always works a seven day work week. He's never worried about taking time off because he's Bishop, right? But some of us, like I always say on Saturday, unless you've died, I'm not paying attention to you on Saturday. So yesterday I went to a funeral, but right. So, right. So we work seven days a week. And not only that, think about this. It's one of the only professions where everything you do counts. So if you work, let's just say you work for Target or Walmart and you, you clock in and you clock out 40 hours a week, your manager does not care what you do outside of that. They don't care How, that you do what you, you do you as long as when you come in, you can function. What we watch on TV what we look at or not look at on the internet, how I treat my wife, how I treat my parents, how I treat my kids, how I do business, um, how I treat my body, like, ev like literally ev scripturally everything I do or not do qualifies me or disqualifies me. So this isn't just a job, like it's all the time, everything I have to do, everything I do, everything I post on the internet, I think I am a pastor, I represent Grace United, is this going to lift up Grace United or, you know, or is my pecan pie going to hurt somebody, right? That, right you, have, you have that. So we work hard. I'm just, I, 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 I tell you that just to let you know, we work hard. And so that's our job. Your job 
is to acknowledge us and to hold us in the what? Highest regard. And I say that simply because of this. You know this is true. We live in a culture of mistrust. If you are a millennial, if you are Gen Z or Gen A, you inherently mistrust institutions and you inherently mistrust leaders. You think, okay, if they're a part of an institution or if they're a leader, they're corrupt. I'm here to tell you, like, number one, we're doing our best job. And number two, Bishop and I and you and the elders, and we're trying to do something in Little Rock that's never been done. And to be the forerunner of any movement is hard. And you take the bullets. So here's what we need from you. I need you to encourage me. And I need you to lift me up because our arms get tired like Moses and we need y'all to lift lift our arms up. And let me say this, y'all do a good job. Thank you, Grace United. You're doing a good job. Keep it up, right? Keep going because we need you tomorrow, right? So keep it up. Uh, So that's, that's the only part that's about me. You're like, I'm uninterested in this sermon because it's not about me. It is the other 11 points directly to you because we talked about you and your pastors. Now we're going to talk about you and other people. Everyone want to say me and other people. All right, because here's the thing. He says that we're supposed to live in peace with one another. And all of us are like, amen, brother, let's live in peace with one another. The question is, like, we don't. We all like that idea, but we don't. So how do we do it? He gives you five things in rapid order. Number one, he says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, to warn those who are what? And what? Okay, there's two kinds of people in the world, and specifically there's two kinds of people in the church. There's the overly responsible and the irresponsible. The overly responsible, they say 80% of the work in a church is done by what? 20% of the people, right? Because you serve a lot, and you give a lot, and you pray a lot, and you encourage a lot. You are overly responsible. On the opposite side of the spectrum, there are the irresponsible. You don't serve, you're only served. You don't give, you're only given to. You don't pray, you're only prayed for. And you don't unify, you only spread seeds of dissension and gossip and usurping. The question is, what are we supposed to do with you, right? And this is what Bishop says. So this is a Bishop saying. He says, grace does not what? Grace does not, but grace with love and patience, just like any parent does, just like any good employer, right? We are here and we are, but I'll tell you what, as your pastors, our job is to honest and bring you back, right? That's the unfun one. The rest are pretty fun. Here you go. Number three, we're supposed to encourage the who. Okay, let me ask you two questions. The first one's hard. The second one's easy. Question number one. I'm just warning you, it's going to be really hard for you to lift your hand right now, but you might need to lift your hand right now. So um, how many of you are here and online? How many of you... When I say encourage, this isn't hard. Those that are beat down, those that are tired of life, those who <laughs> life has thrown you so many times that it's you just, how many of you by raise of hands, the word disheartened would describe you this morning? I've got four and about 56 liars. <laughs> I'm just, there you go. That's better. Now I only have 52 liars. <laughs> disheartened. Encourages his heart. Let me ask you another question. This one's a little bit easier. How many of you would say, I have too many encouragers in my life? I've got so many people encouraging me and sending me encouragement. And it's just, I'm just like, please stop with the encouraging text and the letters and the phone calls. Please stop with all that. I just, your, your encouragement is a burden. How many of you have too many encouragers in your life? Okay, good. There's no one, no liars. Y'all are truthful in that. Lied last time, truthful now. Remember, my job is to call you out. Part of my job. It just is. 
So here's what I want you to do. We're going to practice this together right now. This is weird. You don't normally do this in church, but I'm going to ask you to do something weird. If you'll just play along with your pastor and, you know, honor those who are supposed to be honored, that type of thing. Okay, here we go. I want you to do three things. The first one is simple. I want you to pray in just one second. Before you do that, let me tell you what to pray for. I want you to pray in the next 10 seconds. I want you to pray that the Holy Spirit puts someone in your mind that needs to be Encourage. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Pray to the Holy Spirit. You put someone in your mind that you need to be encouraged. Go, pray. That feels like 10 seconds. All right, number two, I want you to do something else. Please follow me. Please do what I'm asking you to do. It's for you. It's not for me. Pull your phone out. Everyone pull your phone out. Pull your phone out. Pull your, what is he telling? Pull, does he mean pull his phone out? Pull your phone out. Pull your phone out, right? Teenagers already have them out. The rest of you, pull your phone out. Next, if you are not adverse to texting, what I want you to do right now, right now, is text that person something like this. I just thought about you. I prayed over you. I'm so thankful for you. Just send them that text. By the way, you should pray for them as you're sending that text so you're not lying. Uh, and number two, I'm going to keep moving because I've got a long summer to go. So, but it's okay. You watch Netflix and text all the time. You can do two things at once. I'm going to keep moving. You finish your text to encourage someone. So number three, we're supposed to encourage. It doesn't hard. Number four, Help the week. Everyone say help the week. Help the week, right? Because you are texting. Help the week. <laughs> the illustration that I always give that I love is simply this. Um, we have some stairs over here at Grace United Church. You go to the top of the stairs and there's some uh, glass doors that y'all all walk through. I want you to imagine at the, at the top of the stairs that those glass doors that you walk through. Y'all know those metal detectors that they have at airports and in schools, right? You walk through and they go beep, 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 right? So imagine that you're walking through the beep, 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 right? But in the beep, beep, right, it's not a metal detector. What happens is, what happens is there's a screen over that and it tells everyone What's going on in your life if you walk through that? What would you see? I'll tell you what you would see. As all of us walk through that detector, that we'll call it a life detector, what would happen is you'd see some people like they're addicted and they can't get out of it. They are crushingly lonely and isolated. They are hopeless. Life has beaten them down so far. They are filled with shame. They're filled with guilt. They're, they, they are penniless. They don't know how their electricity, if it's going to be on when they get home, right? Here's the deal. <laughs> Help the weak. Here's the deal. The weak are us. The weak are us. How can we help? You know, that's a long thing. But let me just give you one suggestion because we got to move. One suggestion. When you're weak and when you're beaten down, you tend to isolate. You're like, I'm hurting, so therefore I'll go away. Which is, of course, the dumbest thing you can do. But I get it. Like, we're all humans. I get it, right? So here's, like, so you're going to do that. But listen, all the rest of us, when that person is isolating, maybe it's your job to go and get them. It's your job to say, hey, I'd love to have coffee. And they're like, ah, oh, I can't make it. And the next day you say, hey, let's go have coffee. Right? You become that encouragement. They're like, you're speeding down. Somebody text, right? right? But you need to go grab that brother or sister that's isolating. Number four. Number five, we are supposed to be patient with everybody. All right, two truths. You're going to love this. All right, here we go. Two truths. Y'all ready? All right. Number one, y'all can say amen after this, okay? People are annoying. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Oh, gosh, man. You people, I mean people. People are two truths. People are annoying. Number two, y'all can amen after this one. You are people. <laughs> yeah, you annoying. You real annoying. But here's the deal. Tell me if, tell me if I'm lying. So, so far, I don't think I'm lying. You are super patient with yourself. 
crazy patient with yourself. Like you have like 1,046 excuses why you haven't done the thing that you know you should have done three weeks ago. But you know, you okay with that. You're going to forgive yourself. But if someone else forgets one time, mm, who am I supposed to be patient with? I'm supposed to be patient with everyone. What about that... Um, what about that racist coworker? They fit into everyone. What about your two year old little terrorist? <laughs> Amen. To everyone. What about that white pastor that just, <laughs> you just like, when's Bishop gonna come back, right? <laughs> I get it. I understand. Him too. <laughs> everyone. All right. Me and Roger's friends over. Anybody else? All right. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Has God been patient with you? How patient? Here's the answer. Eternally. Infinitely patient. Can we not do that with others? Number five, be patient with everyone. Number six, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is what? For who? And for everyone else. Are people going to treat you wrong? Yet we just established that. Yes. Are people going to do evil things to you? Yes. Okay. Wait, wait, are you going to do people wrong? Yes. Are you going to do evil things to people? Yes. What are we supposed to do? Paul says three things. We're supposed to seek God. How often? Always for who? For everyone. Three truths, rapid fire truths. Number one, you can't treat people the way they treat you. You have to treat people the way Jesus treats you. Yeah. Romans 5, chapter 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Died for us. You sinner, he died for you. Repeat process with other people. Number two, your response is what? Your responsibility. Listen, here's the deal. Y'all know this is true. We try to control other people. We try, but here's the deal. You can't control yourself. You can't control other people. What you can do is when they do annoying things to you, you can make sure that your response is your responsibility because ultimately the third truth is this. If you trust Jesus to take care of your sin, you can trust Jesus to take care of what? Their sin. Listen, the scripture says over and over and over, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Here's the deal. The Lord's going to take care of their sin one way or another. He's either going to forgive their sin or he's going to judge their sin. Either way, it's his to do and not yours, right? So here's the deal. With this passage, we're halfway through. I'm telling you, 12 things are rapid fire. Can you imagine a church, Grace United, in Little Rock, can you imagine a church that lives in peace with one another? That when people are disruptive, we warn them for their sake. We encourage the innocent hearted at Grace United. We help the weak at Grace United. We're patient with everyone at Grace United. And when people do us wrong at Grace United, we don't return evil for evil, but we return good for that. I tell you what, that would be a church that I would want to go to. That would be a church that I believe people in Little Rock would want to go to. I believe if there was a church like that in Little Rock, it would shine the gospel so bright that people would meet Jesus. Do y'all think that's true? Okay, let's be that church. All right, we're halfway through. We talked about you and your pastor, which is super uncomfortable. We talked about you and other people, which is sort of uncomfortable. Now we're going to talk about you and God. Everyone say me and God. All right. We got six more to go, but they're really, really quick. Number seven, rejoice how often? Okay. We just established this. We're not pretending that things don't go wrong. We're not pretending that evil happens. We're not pretending that sometimes we do wrong. But here's the deal. Okay. Think about Jesus. You remember that story where Jesus was like in the boat and his disciples were in the boat and like the storm came and the boat was like, right, right. And the disciples were like, oh, we're all going to die. And Jesus was like taking a nap at the bottom of the ship, right? And then they're like, oh, what should we do? Should we wake him up? They're like, we should go wake him up. And they go wake up Jesus up and he's super annoyed. He's like, I was taking a nap, right? You're like, oh, why'd you wake me up? Right? And, and they're like, oh, well, it's, it's super rocky. And he says, listen, you don't have to worry about the waves if I'm in the boat. 
Right? Y'all remember that? I mean, this is his Joshua version. But you don't have to worry about the ways of Joshua. But if, 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 if Jesus is in the boat, he says this. Joy isn't something we work on. Joy is something that we live in. Because if you know Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your boat. And there's going to be waves left and right in your life. I know. <laughs> if, I, if I told you my waves here lately, you would be like, what? How is he standing up there? I'm just letting you know, right? The waves come, but we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. So it's not something you have to work on. It's just something you have to accept and let it live in you. Number seven. Number eight, we're supposed to pray how often? Okay, super simple. Okay, um, disciples are like, hey, Jesus, we don't know how to pray because we're like little kids. Can you teach us how to pray? And Jesus is like, sure, I'll teach you how to pray. You begin like this, our what? Father who art in heaven, right? So he says, and this is all throughout scripture, the basic idea that we need to understand God to be is like a father, which makes us what? Kids, children, whatever, all correct answers. Let me ask you a question. For those of you that have kids or were a kid, that's all of you, right? Just making sure, <laughs> doing the math. Okay. Um, how do kids talk to their parents? Three things. Often, in short spurts, and about anything. Often, in short spurts, and about anything. How should you talk to your father in heaven? Often, in short spurts and about anything, right? That's the way that we, that's how do you pray continually? Often in short spurts and about anything. But here's the problem. Most of us don't pray. Most of us spread our anxiety to others instead of giving it to Jesus in prayer. Let me show you what I mean. I'm about to illustrate something to you and you'll be like, that has never happened in my life. Second lie you've told in this sermon. Here we go. Okay. Let's say that I'm looking at my phone and I look at something that stresses me out. Ugh. My first inclination, tell me if I'm wrong, my first inclination is I've got to text this to Tracy. Tracy's got to see this, right? So Tracy's over here and she's like, she's like, boo, boo, oh, Josh texted me. I wonder what Josh texted me. And she looks, she says, oh no. And so she's overcome with anxiety. And then she's like, oh, what am I going to do that? And she goes, well, I'm going to text it to Leon. And Leon goes, oh, Tracy's texting me. What's she texting me? And so now I'm stressed and she's stressed and, it, and he's stressed and it goes, duh, 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 duh. and now we live in a community of anxiety and we feel better that everyone else is, at least everyone else is freaking like I'm freaking out, or at the very beginning, I say, oh gosh, that, that stresses me out. Okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Okay, Tracy can't help me. We can talk about our feelings later, but Father, you're the one that can, can you, I mean, all the nations, all the elected officials, all the DAOs and the S&P 5, like you all, you, you, and I need your help. And I give it to Jesus instead of spreading my anxiety. What if we did that? That's number eight. Number nine, I'm telling you, we're moving fast. We're supposed to give thanks in what? All circumstances. How many circumstances? All circumstances. Just to be very clear, we're supposed to give thanks in everything, not what? For everything. Some things are wrong. Some things are evil. This is the fourth time I've brought that up in the same sermon. Some things are wrong. Some things are evil. Some people are wrong. Some people are evil. Some situations that you've caused, some situations that we caused you are wrong and evil. But we can give thanks in everything because just one example, Romans 8 28. And we know that in how many things? All things God does what? Works for the good for those who love Him. Here's the truth. Everything doesn't come from God, but everything passes through God's hands. What do you mean, Josh? Let me give you one illustration, and then we can move on. Here's the illustration. And this is a trick question. I'm letting you know it's a trick question. Okay, here's your trick question. Was the brutal, brutal murder of the innocent Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, who did nothing, 
nothing to deserve what happened to him an evil thing or a good thing? Both. It is both the most evil thing. Make no mistake. It is the most evil thing that has ever occurred in time and space and history. Bar none, nothing's close. And it's the most glorious and holy and wonderful thing that has ever happened in time and space and history. Bar none, it's both. It's both. So we can give thanks in all things because he works all things together for the good of those who love him. That's number nine. Number 10, we got three more and they're about the Holy Spirit. So half of y'all are going to be uncomfortable. Here we go. Uh, it says, do not quench the who? The Spirit. Okay. And if you weren't uncomfortable with that, about that, you're going to be uncomfortable with my illustration because the best illustration I can think of to quenching the Spirit, is to, it's like putting out a fire, is like when you, t- some, you know, when people take a cigarette and they put the cigarette like that and then they put it on the ground and then they do like that, that's quenching. That's quenching a fire. A lot of us quench the spirit. We take the spirit and we do like that and we throw it on the ground and we do like that. And you're like, I don't do that. Oh, maybe. (laughs) Right? Let me give you a couple of examples. One is uh, the the tradition that I grew up in back in the day, if you can tell with the illustration I'm about to give, I'm no longer there. But um, the tradition I grew up in, uh, men in the church... uh, you are expected to stick your hands in your pocket and like this, like, you know, keep your guns in their little holsters, like, and, uh, and this is like, like if a, if a dude did like this, they, you were like, what is happening in our church? Like they're at the wrong church, right? Cause your tradition, the traditions there is like everyone worships very quietly and solemnly with your hands in your pocket. The only problem is the Bible says that men are supposed to praise God with land, with hands lifted high. That's what scripture says. So you got scripture versus tradition. And for those of us that are like, I'm going to go with tradition, that's quenching the spirit. Some of us have bad theology. I'm going to say, I say a word that most of y'all don't understand, but I'm going to explain it. Cessationism. What cessationism basically says is this. It's a whole school of thought. School seminaries teach us. It's called cessationism. What it means is God used to do big things and he no longer does big things. The things that you see in the Bible, you should not expect to see today, Right. That's wrong. I'm just telling you. Like, it just, it just, it just is. Uh, but other things, you're like, well, I don't do that. Okay, unrepentance. We know what God says, but we just not concerned doing it. Um, I know all of y'all are 100% on following God, but I, I, I sort of grieve God sometimes and quench the spirit there. Disunity, unforgiveness, not using your spiritual gifts. God gave you spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit, and some of you are like, I'm going to keep that for myself, right? Quenching the spirit, right? Number 10, don't quench. Number 11, do not treat prophecies with what? Contempt. Here's a real simple thing. What does that mean? Prophecies are God speaking to you. Contempt is ignoring that. Okay. Okay. So what's the number one way that God speaks to us? The, the Bible, right? He, he like literally wrote you a book that you can read, right? And listen to, you know, podcast, whatever. There's a thousand ways you can get it in, right? And contempt is what? Ignoring it. So for those of us with scripture, how do I teach prof- how, how do I, how do I treat prophecy with contempt? Well, you have the word of God there with you, literally on your phone with you right now. And statistically, most of us spend three hours and 45 minutes a day on our cell phones and social media and various apps. And then we say, I don't have any time to get into the word of God. It, it, that's a lie. You're just treating prophecy with contempt. Just, it, it's the way it is. We love you. And we want, to, we want to all grow together, right? But also, but think about this. Prophecy is not the only way. Um, so some of y'all are like, oh, I love the Bible part. Okay, here's the other part that makes some of y'all uncomfortable. Um, God will give other people, this is the way we say it in church. If you're not in church, let me use the church word. They'll give, you, they'll give someone else a word for you, right? Someone else, like, they, say, they say, hey, I want you to go uh, uh, speak into someone else's life, okay? And like when someone comes and gives you a word, uh, you should 
you should listen to them. Um, but we'll get to what you should do in just a second. But here's the deal. For those of you, so none of us have that go give a word to somebody type of gift. But for those of you that do, let me give you a little suggestion. There's a way to do it wrong, a way to do it right. The way to do it wrong is when you get a word for somebody to go up to them and say, thus saith the Lord to you. The holy God from on high was right. Because listen, I'm telling you, like I've, I've had that. If you come at me with that, like I'm out. Like I'm just out. I'm just letting you know. Like whatever you say next, I'm out. Like I'm not listening to you, right? Because that has been so abused so many times. But if the Lord gives you something for somebody else, what you should do is go up to someone and say, you know what? I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you something. And, and my job is just to tell you. And so... You can do with it whatever you want, but I'm just being faithful. And I'll tell you what, in the first service, she's not in here, but in the first service, there's a lady called Mother Hill. By the way, uh, uh, for those of you that are African-Americans, the white church, we don't have mothers of the, of the church. We, like, we had no, when, y'all, when we came together, they were like, we should have mothers of the church. I was like, what is that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so Mother Hill came to us and uh, this was a, a year ago and Mother Hill, if I were to say the holiest moment I've ever had at Grace United was with Mother Hill because she got a word from the Lord and she came in this church because she was supposed to, she was supposed to speak it over me and Bishop and Neil and she was supposed to pray over us and anoint our heads with oil and it freaked her out. She, she came in those front doors trembling. She literally, her hands were like this. And she was like, the Lord told me to do something, but I'm just, ooh, she was so nervous to do it because you have these, you know, these, her pastors and she's like, ah, right. And then she, she prayed, she spoke it over us. <laughs> and she prayed over us. And she anointed our heads with oil. I mean, I had oil all over the stuff. I got to just take a shower. And it was the most holy moment I have had in this church in its two-year existence, bar none. Bar none. Because she was faithful, Right? I'm glad she came. But not everyone that does that is not crazy. Some of them crazy, which is why you should (laughs) test them all. Number 12, here we go. Test them all. Hold on to what's good. Reject every kind of, because here's the deal. Here's the deal, people. Three kinds of people, naive, jaded, and discerning. Some of y'all naive, right? You're like, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Don't believe everything. Some of y'all are jaded because you've been paying attention, right? Uh, and so you've just gotten a, hard, you've gotten a hard heart and a hard spirit, and you're like, I'm not going to believe anything. Listen, don't believe everything and don't believe nothing, but do believe the truth. Let's be a church that holds on to the good and releases the evil. Because he says this, right? What if, imagine with me, imagine with me, if, imagine with me if there was a church in Little Rock that rejoiced always and was known for praying continually and gave, gave thanks in all circumstances. No matter what happened, this church gave thanks in all circumstances. And they didn't quench the spirit with, 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 with disunity or bad theology or tradition. This is the way we do things. But they, they didn't treat prophecies with contempt. When the Lord said something, they said, okay, I don't understand it, but I'm going to do it because you said and I'm going to follow along. And then they, they, and they tested it and they held on to what's good and they released what's bad. Can you imagine, what if, what if that church were Grace United? What if we could build that church here in Little Rock? Because I tell you, that's the church I want to be a part of. And that's the church that Little Rock wants, even if they don't know it. 
the, here's the deal. As we finish and as, as the worship team comes up, I understand. Like I told you, like we were rolling. There's 12 commands and they're like rapid fire. And right now you might feel like that's a lot. And there's how can I, right, how can I, I don't even want to do half those things. i just be honest, right? We, like we don't even want to do half those things. Like how am I supposed to do that? And the answer to that question is always this. We can do these things because Jesus has what? Already done it for us. Let me go through the 12 real quick. Jesus holds us in high regard. He calls you a chosen priesthood, a special possession of his, his adopted sons and daughters who he gave his son for. Jesus warns us, this whole chapters in the gospels where he says, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And then when that chapter ends, the next chapter starts with, woe to you, right? So Jesus, <laughs> He encourages us, amen? He helps the weak among us, amen? Jesus is patient with you, amen? Jesus did not pay back your evil with evil. He paid back your evil with his son. Jesus rejoices over you. Hebrews 12, 2, we talk about it all the time. For the joy set before him, he went to the cross. What was the joy that was set before him that he went to the cross? You. He prays for you. We talk about it all that time in John 17. He prays literally for you, not sort of for you. He prays for you. Jesus gave thanks in all things. Father, if this is from your hand, yes, give it to me. Number 11, he obeyed, he did not treat prophecy with contempt. Number one, he says, everything that the Lord asked me to do, I'm gonna do. He was, a, he was 100% on following what God. And number two, he fulfilled every Old Testament scripture. And number 12, Jesus, in the end, in your end, and in the end of all things, will look at everything and he will take what is good and what is holy and what is righteous and what is saved through him. He will do this. He will get rid of all evil, all of that he will get rid of that. And we will live with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth, the garden that we messed up, he will bring back into a whole and we will be with our